There we go. Hello. Okay. All right, Ashish, can you hear yes. us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me and can you see the screen? Yes, everything seems to work well. That's great. Uh, okay. All right. So, uh, yes, I think we are, we are ready. We are not doing big introductions. So, the yeah. yeah. uh, floor is yours. Okay. So, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ashish Judge, a postdoc at UIUC with uh, Sergey Maslov and James O'Dwyer. And um, today I'm going to tell you about how thermodynamics affects microbial communities growing in places like deep under the ocean sediments shown here. This is work I did with Sergey and Tom, and it's on BioArchive if you want to take a look. Now, as I'm sure everyone here knows, microbial communities perform a number of important chemical transformations that are integral to life on Earth. They take carbon dioxide from the uh, atmosphere and put it in the ocean. They fix nitrogen to help plants grow or aid in digestion. And based on the energetics of these chemical transformations, we can roughly divide them into two halves. On one side, we have communities like those that we grow in the lab or fix nitrogen for plants, uh, which use highly energetic reactions to drive their growth, like glucose oxidation. These reactions have a free energy that is very uh, negative, and it is the making the reaction irreversible. Uh, on the left, we have communities that grow deep in the soil or in these anaerobic bioreactors, where over and uh, over half of Earth's prokaryotic biomass resides in such places, um, where um, species use low free energy reactions, that is delta G is near zero, to drive their growth, making these reactions sort of reversible. Now we can think of roughly these communities on the left being energy limited. And on the right, the growth of these communities is limited by the availability of some essential resource to build biomass. So we can consider them to be nutrient limited. Now growth in energy limited communities is very slow. Division times are measured in weeks or years rather than hours and days. And these long time scales make energy limited communities um, really hard to probe uh, experimentally. So identifying the rules governing these energy limited communities through theory and simulations could really help us understand them better. Unfortunately, most of the work focuses on these neutral limited scenarios. Uh, and so the focus of my talk will be on a model aim to understand these energy limited communities uh, better. This model needs to account for both the reversibility of these catabolic reactions, as well as the energy limited nature of their growth. And this is inspired a lot by a work in Orkin Sawyer's group. Uh, now, in this model, we think of a, a simple catabolic reaction that a species uses to drive its, uh, get energy. It, the species converts a substrate S into product P by allocating some part of its enzyme budget to the reaction specific enzyme and it gains an energy EATP from this reaction which it uses to drive its growth. Now because of the reversibility of the reaction, um, the chemical flux is J is going to be described by a reversible Michaelis uh, Menten kinetics which briefly uh, means that the flux is going to increase with the amount of enzyme allocated to the reaction it's going to become independent of substrate when the enzyme is saturated, and it's going to decrease due to thermodynamic inhibition. This thermodynamic inhibition describes how the net flux decreases as the products accumulate, and the inhibition strength depends on the heat dissipated in the reaction Q, which is given by the standard difference in free energies of the substrate and product, further reduced by the energy the cell assimilates EATP. Because growth uh, is energy limited, the growth rate is going to be proportional to the energy flux from a particular reaction. Now, we can think of a complex environment where there are multiple resources. We are going to order these resources from R0 to R5 in the order of, uh, in the order of the decreasing free energy. Uh, and reactions connecting any two resources in this environment are in principle allowed. However, species will use only reactions going downward, 
since they want to gain energy from this reaction rather than lose. Because a species can catalyze more than one reaction by allocating some part of its enzyme budget to the different uh, enzymes, the growth rate is now going to be summed up over the different reactions the species catalyzes. So now with this, we have a prescription for how species grow utilizing reversible reactions in an energy limited manner. We can now describe a community through a system of ODEs where the species abundance N, uh, a species abundance with N uh, grows due to growth rate, this G, and then gets diluted with Delta. This dilution represents this constant removal of content in a bioreactor or uh, the influx of sediment in a marine environment. The resource concentrations change due to the influx and outflux in the various reactions, and again, through this dilution. So now we have basically a complete model of energy limited mi microbial communities, which we can simulate to find what are the emergent properties in these systems. Now to focus on these slow growing microbial communities that we're interested in, uh, we ensure that Delta is small. To mimic communities that have assembled in a specific environment over centuries or millennia, we introduce a large number of species in a species pool into a very well-defined environment and study the outcome. To understand the robust features of these communities that over, appear over and over again, we repeat this by introducing different species pools into identical environments. Here, an environment is determined by uh, the set of resources, their energies, and the energy assimilated in each reaction. And the resource that is most energetic, R0, is supplied. The species themselves differ in terms of their enzyme budgets and allocation, and in, uh, also the enzyme kinetics. Now, once you allow these species to grow, you would expect different reactions to get uh, preferred in these different species pools. However, what we find is that species that survive the ecological competition in the different pools chose to use the same subset of reactions represented by these colored arrows. Further, like we can measure the fluxes in these reactions denoted by these circles here, um, which are also highly similar across pools. This bar plot shows the fluxes in these different reactions with colors corresponding to the, each reaction. So this shows that communities seem to converge in terms of the metabolic function. And now the obvious question here is, uh, do species sort of play identical roles in each of these communities? So for that, we measure how species contribute to the different reactions in the pool. And we find that these contributions differ between pools. For example, here, the reaction R1 to R2 is catalyzed by a single species in pool one, but three different species in pool two. So this means that uh, this, uh, this uh, can also be shown, in, this uh, pattern also is manifested in the bar plot of this relative abundance of taxa, which do not show any kind of convergent patterns. So this functional convergence, despite sort of taxonomic divergence that we see in simulations, it resembles observations in many natural microbial communities and industrial environments. For example, here we have communities that grow in waterlogged pitcher plants um, where the functional abundance is uh, quantified by the relative abundance of the functional genes and show it which converges. But the communities differ in terms of the taxonomic composition between each plant. Now, given the similarity between simulations uh, and natural observations, we set about figuring uh, set about figuring uh, how how this happens in an analy analytical manner. So, the two questions basically are: uh, Why is the same subset of reactions selected across pools, and why are the fluxes through these reactions similar? In the simplest scenario, we can think of just a reaction going from our resource R0 to R1. Uh, here, in a species grows on this, the steady state growth of the species is going to be balanced by dilution rate. And so for a slow growing species, 
we are have, we are thinking about this small delta. With this, uh, if the reaction is slowed uh, and the growth and the reaction is slowed due to thermodynamic inhibition, the reaction is near equilibrium and the ratio of the two resource concentrations to leading order in this delta is given by the heat dissipated in the reaction. We can generalize this to an arbitrary tree-like network where the ratio of the two resources is determined by uh, the heat dissipated along the path in the network. Specifically, like if we think of a resource R4, um, here the ratio of concentration of R4 to R0 is going to be given, determined by the heat dissipated in the reactions R0, R1, and R1, R4. So this prescribes how the steady state concentration for a given network uh, is, but it doesn't tell us why this network is selected. For that, uh, to understand what network is selected from ecological competition, we compare two possible paths to the same resource, this red and green. Now, if these paths existed, existed separately, the ratio of R4 to R0 is going to be given by the heat dissipated along, the, along each path shown here. Now, clearly these two expressions cannot, are not equal, and so they cannot exist simultaneously. So uh, only one of these paths actually can survive carrying a non-zero flux. In, the, in particular, uh, the red path will remain active if the heat dissipated along it is greater than the other. In other words, the reaction network of the community is selected by this principle of maximum heat dissipation. Now this explains why different species pools chose the same path. We can use this to calculate uh, in a simple in the simpler scenario the concentration of the resources in the environment, which is, resembles this Gibbs uh, Boltzmann distribution in statistical physics. And further, uh, we can calculate the fluxes as well in the environment, which match the simulations. Now, note that this means the metabolic function and the metabolic environment is basically determined by uh, the heat, uh, heat dissipated in the reactions up to leading order in delta. Once communities start growing faster or delta becomes larger, we act the, this principle breaks down and the accuracy of the predictive network drops and functional convergence also uh, drops or rather the functional distance increases. We can actually uh, inspired by this, we uh, wanted to look for um, a case where we can validate this in a real microbial uh, data. And we found this um, experiments by Pisces et al, uh, where they operated anaerobic digesters, four different anaerobic digesters at steady state. Uh, this, these, these digesters all had, um, each had different communities from different environments. Um, and each resistor was operated at four different dilution rates. And uh, so for each resistor, we have a list of four different dilution rates or dilution times. And they also measured the concentration of various metabolites like acetate. Now we can think of what we can actually use this data to measure how much the resource environment converged for a particular dilution rate in the different digesters. Or specifically, we can look at the ratio of the standard deviation to mean, which is the coefficient of variation for a given dilution time across these digesters uh, and see how this coefficient of variation changes with this dilution rate. A high coefficient of variation means that the resource environment is um, uh, very different between digesters, while a low coefficient means that the environment is very similar. We plotted this for all the different meta, uh, short chain fatty acids that they measured. And we found that the coefficient of variation increased across all the digesters. Further, the distances in the resource environments between the digesters also increased with this dilution rate, which means that the resource um, environment, the convergence in the resource environment weakened as dilution rate increased. Indeed, we see the same um, patterns uh, when we do uh, simulations of our model as well. 
and this serves to be a validation of our theoretical analysis. Now, I guess to quickly summarize, we started off, we are looking at um, these microbial communities that grow in these energy limited environments, like these ocean sediments or anaerobic bioreactors. We considered a model that incorporates the reversibility of each reaction um, and the energy limited nature of their growth. We found that uh, the metabolic fluxes and function of the different, uh, from different species pool converged. Or even though the species uh, split up these fluxes in sort of idiosyncratic ways, the reaction network selected by these different species pool was chosen by the principle of maximum heat dissipation. And this principle, we use this principle to predict the metabolic fluxes in simulations using um, uh, uh, with good accuracy. And finally, we used uh, experimental data from these anaerobic digesters to sort of validate our predictions that this resource environment in these uh, communities would start, uh, would be highly similar when dilution rate is small and start uh, to diverge as um, dilution rate is high. So with that, I'm uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, the preprints up online if anyone wants to know more. All right, I think in this case, we need to use the microphone or maybe not, maybe these things are picking up. Let's try. Uh, we need to use the microphone. All right, I'll run around. Uh, hi, thank you. Lovely presentation. Uh, I was wondering when you're evaluating the free energy, are you correcting by activity? Um, so you mean activity of the enzyme? Yeah, I mean, the basic pathway analysis, you're, you're using yeah. heat dissipation, and I guess you're calculating with uh, free energies of the catabolic react reaction, right? Yeah. And um, those those free energies are calculate are corrected by activity or so uh, the the free energy that we use is just uh, rep some kind of like assumption right we don't have we are not using real data for the free energies no no it's uh, I mean obviously you got your table of uh, free energy and then you calculate their their reaction energy that's I think that's available for everyone yeah but then like in this very near zero free energies activity correction plays are plays are an important role you can see the variations so I think the model I I, I like the approach but I mm -hmm. think you can get surprised by some results if you also as well correct by by activity I it it has been interesting yeah that's my and I'd love yeah. to see the preprint <laughs> thank you yeah yeah oh um it's thanks for the interesting talk so just a question when you showed these experimental data of the digesters to run at different dilution rates Mm -hmm. Did they look at the composition of species? So like if you look at the species compositions, are they also more reproducible at the lower dilution rate compared to the high one? Uh, so the species composition uh, is for each register had its own species, set of species. So like one was from some kind of pig skin, one was from something else. Um, so there is no, con they can't talk about convergence anymore because there is no, uh, there's no different digesters of the same starting species, starting community. Is that, does that make sense? No, but it's, it's I think we, we're getting the gist of it. So, uh, but hopefully uh, there will be a little bit of in, uh, discussion time where you can join us as well. So maybe we can okay. follow up some of these questions. All right, any more questions from the floor? All right, if not, we're going to move on. Thanks a lot, Ashish, for a nice talk. Yep. And uh, yeah, I also like the next talk will actually be quite uh, relevant to thinking about species composition, just uh, plugging. All right.